Okay, good afternoon. So today we will cover the protection, how we can protect the system resources. So we will see some mechanisms and how we can, we will see some mechanisms for doing that and how we can define the protection rules that will be used in protecting the resources in the computer system. So this is actually the chapter 14 of the textbook. So an operating system and the system over which the operating system operates, all right, a computer system consists of a collection of objects or resources, okay, hardware or software objects or resources that needs to be protected. So each object can be referred by a name, has a unique name, so that we can refer to that object with that unique name. And each object also has a set of well-defined operations, okay, that can be invoked, okay, by a process that has the right to do so. So now the protection problem is this. We should ensure, the system should ensure that each object in the system that is, needs to be protected is accessed correctly and only by those processes that are allowed to do so, okay? So each object should be, should be accessed by those processes that has, that have authorization to access the objects, okay, all right? So in the system we have objects, hardware or software objects, for example, the CPU, memory segments and so on, right? Hardware objects and so also we have software object like, objects like files, semaphores and some other system objects. So we need to protect them. And we have in a computer system users, processes and some other systems that are remotely accessing this system as the possible entities that would like to access those objects, right? So it, these objects have some operations defined. For example, a file can be read, written, executed, and so on. These are the possible operations that can be executed over a file. So now the protection problem is this. We should allow those processes that have authorization to use those objects and access those objects. And a process that does not have the authorization should not be allowed to access the object, okay? So we should be able to define the access rights, which objects should be used by which process and in which way, okay? We should be able to define those access rights and we should be able to enforce that, okay? So this is the protection problem. As a result, we would like to ensure that each object here is accessed correctly and only by those processes that are allowed to do so, okay? So how can we define the protection rules, access rights, and how can we enforce them, okay? This is the topic of this lecture. So while you are providing a system and a protection scheme on that system, all right, we should follow a guiding principle for the protection. This is called the principle of least privilege, okay? So while designing a protection scheme, usually we follow such a principle. What that principle is, what is that principle? So the programs, users, and systems should be given just enough privileges to perform their tasks, okay? So you should not give unnecessary privileges. Otherwise, a malfunctioning process or a malicious process or user may use those extra privileges in some wrong ways to do some harm, all right? So you should give the just enough privileges that are required to do the task, okay? So this is called the principles of protection. So if you are going to design a protection scheme, so we require from that protection scheme these two things. The first requirement is this. A process should be allowed to access only those resources for which it has authorization. A process should not be able to access a resource for which it has no authorization, okay? The second requirement from a protection scheme is this. A process should be able to access only those resources that it currently requires to complete its task, okay? it should not be able to access the resources that it doesn't need at the moment. So you don't have to give authorization for those resources at that time, okay, when the process is not needing them. You should give authorization when the process is needing them, all right? So this is called need to know principle. To satisfy those requir requirements, okay, usually a system enforces a process to operate within a protection domain. So what's a protection domain? A protection domain in which a process is operating, okay, a protection domain specifies which resources objects can be accessed 
and in which way by the processes operating in this domain, okay? For example, consider the university, okay? So we have a university system here. We have different type of users here, students, faculty members, staff, and so on, right? So each has actually some privileges in the university, has some rights to do, right? So actually these students or these people can be considered as processes and now the protection domains can be considered as student domain, staff domain, faculty member domain and so on. So when a person is in faculty domain, it has some certain rights. It can do something in the university, okay? When a student is in, when a person is in student domain, okay, he or she has also some rights to do, okay? So we can have people operating in some domains, right? When you enter the university, you may be either a student, a faculty member, or a staff member, and so on. Depending on which domain you are, you have some certain, some certain privileges, okay? So similarly, in a computer system, the processors may be operating in domains. You can create some certain domains, right? The system administrator or somebody can create some domains, certain protection domains, so that process can be assigned to those domains and can operate in those domains. And depending in which domain the process is operating at the moment, it has some certain rights because for each domain we associate some access rights. A protection domain specifies which resources objects can be accessed in which way by the processes operating in that domain. So this is the protection domain concept. So if you define some domains, when you create a domain and define a domain, that means you specify what can be done by the members of that domain. Which objects can be accessed in which way? Read, read, written, executed, each object. For each object you can specify those when you create a domain. That means you specify a domain together with the access rights of that domain. Then what can happen when a process is created, you can assign that process into a domain, okay? So if a process is assigned to a domain, so while a process is executing, the system ensures that the process can only do what the domain can do, okay? It cannot do anything outside that domain. Some, it cannot do something uh, for which the domain does not have the authorization. So then we have this problem we should be able to associate processes with the domains. For that, we can use static association or dynamic association. Static association means this. You associate a process with a domain and that association is fixed during the lifetime of the process. During the lifetime of the process, it cannot change the domain. This is static association. And dynamic association is more flexible. That means initially a process is assigned a domain, but it can change to a different domain, okay? so that it can get extra privileges and so on during its lifetime, okay? So you allow the processes to change their domains with dynamic association. And other thing is, other issue is how can we define the domains? That means how can we specify the access rights associated with the domains? And there, there is also two choices. When a domain is specified, it can be static so that no change, no further change is allowed. This is static domain, all right? So you define a domain and then it remains as it is. The access rights of the domain does not change, okay? So this is static domain. Or you can define domains that are dynamic. So the domain content can also change. Then we have a dynamic domain. That means you can add more access rights to the domain or remove some access rights from the domain, okay? So you can increase the capability of the domain or decrease the capability of the domain, okay? You can, for example, increase the objects that the domain can access or you can remove some access rights from the domain, okay? You can restrict the domain privileges more, if you wish, okay? Then we have a dynamic domain. So domain structure, how formally a domain is defined how formally a domain is a set of access rights. So what's an access right? An access right is a tuple like that. We have an object name and we specify what kind of operations or rights we have on that object, okay? For example, we can have an object O3, it can be file 3, okay? And we can specify some access, some rights on that object, Re read and write. That means we have read access and write access to object 3, okay? So this is an access right, okay? So we can specify such access rights for each object, and then the set of such access rights 
will be a domain. All right. So here we see an example. We have three, defined here three domains: D1, D2, D3. And in D1, we see how many access rights? How many access rights we defined? Three, right? So we defined those access rights. So this access right is concerning the object O3 and its use. That means we can. If we are operating on the domain D1, if a process is running in domain D1, then it can read object O3 and write object O3. What about object O1? It can also read and write, but object O2, we cannot read, we cannot write, but we can just execute. Probably object O2 is an executable file, and then that means a process operating in that domain can execute that file, but it cannot, for example, inspect the content of the file. It cannot modify the file and so on, okay? So, here, these are the access rights, okay, defined for that domain. So all processes, there may be 100 different processes operating in that domain, all of these processes will have such access rights. Each process may execute O2, read, write, O1, and so on, okay? So we have specified another domain, D2. How many access rights do we have in D2? Hmm? We have specified two access rights, right? This is one access right and another access right. So this access right says what? What kind of a right does it give? It gives a right on which object? O2, right? Object 2, file 2, for example. And what is the right that we can we have here, or operation that we can perform? Right operation. It says that we can write O2, okay? If you are a process operating in D2, that means you can open O2 and write into it, okay? This is given, okay? So this system will allow that. But if you are trying to read O2, the system will not allow, okay? When you are in domain D2, okay, and when you are trying to read O2, the system will not allow that, okay? So the system will enforce that these rights are observed, these access rights are, are observed, okay? And here we have another right which says that object O4 is printable, okay? It can be printed by a process running in that domain. So we have another domain which is D3, right? How many access rights do we have there? We have specified three access rights here concerning objects O1, O3, and O4. So O1 can be executed, O3 can be read, for example, by a process running in domain D3, and also a process running in domain D3 can print object 4, okay? So the domains can overlap, actually, all right? Some access rights may belong to, these, to, to more than one domain, right? So if a process, either operating here or there, can print out for example, object O4, okay? So if you want to print out something, that means you have to be either operating in this domain or on that domain, yes? Without the read permission? Right, so actually, this can be, for example, a device file, okay? Not an ordinary file. So that means you can print, so I actually expressed this wrong. That means I said that, we are printing O4. It is not that. We are printing into O4. O4 may be an object like a printer, which may be actually referred with a file name. In Unix, you can do that. All the devices are referred with a file name. These are the special files that, we, they, that they are sitting in slash dev directory, okay? So we are referring to the hardware device also with some file names, uh, device files, we call them. So here, for example, we use the device file corresponding to printer, Okay, this is O4, and we say print, okay, that means we can print into that, okay? So a process running here or there can print, but a process running in domain D1 cannot write into printer, all right? So this is how we can specify the domains and so on, and then in this way we are actually specifying access rights, okay? And we are, for example, putting the process in one of the domains, and in this way we are defining what the process can do and what it cannot do, okay? So the system also enforces these rules. In this way, we have some protection. Here, for example, if a process is started in domain D1, we are guaranteed that that process will not be able to print, for example, to O4 and so on, okay? So let's give an example, domain example in Unix. How does Unix defines the domains and how it enforces the processes to go into domains and the protection is finally achieved in Unix operating system, okay? So in Unix, what we have, we have processes, right? And we would like, for example, restrict the access from the processes to the files. Those files may be actually files on the hard disk, or they may be actually files referring to devices. So we would like to actually protect the devices plus the files on the hard disk, okay? 
So a Unix system is actually a multi-user system, right? At any time, there may be several users who can log into the system. Or from time to time, you may be logging, and then another person may log into the system and so on, right? So it's a multi-user environment. Each user may create some files. You may have created some files in this system, and another user may have created some files, okay? So you may want to protect your files. You may, for example, want your files to be not written by somebody else, but just read, okay? So you specify for each of, of your file the protection rules, okay? For example, you enable read access for others, but not write access for others, and so on, okay? So we have such a file system, right, with protection with access bits set. Now, process can be created in such a system. What you, happens when you log into the system, right? You enter your username and password. Then you have a user ID and group ID, okay? So then you can create several processes. All these processes that are created by you actually has the same user ID that you have, okay? So in Unix, actually, a domain is defined by the user ID. So if a process is operating on domain X, means that the process is actually created by a user X, okay? If we have five users that have an account here, that means we have five different domains, okay? So this is the how domains are defined in Unix. So the domain of a process is defined by its user ID, and also the group ID can be used to define the domain, okay? And we know that the files, it can be files on the disk, all files corresponding to devices, also have associated user IDs and group ID, okay? If you have created a file, then that file has your user ID associated as the owner with the file, okay? Then what we can do? A process, there may be several processes created, then we can make a list of files, including files corresponding to devices, that can be accessed by the process. So when a process is created with some user ID, all right, then if you look to the all files in the file system, you can see which files can be accessed by that process, right? Because for each file, you, we specify some access rights. And also for the process, we know the user ID of the file. We can compare the user ID, sorry, for the process. We can compare the user ID of the process with the user IDs associated with the files. If they match, that means those files can be easily accessed by the process and so on, right? So this is how we actually control the access to the files from different processes. So when a user logs in, all processes created by that user operate in the same domain, in that user's domain. What should happen when a process tries to execute a file which is created by another user, however? So if you have logged in, okay, you create the process and that process would like to execute a file that is created by you, there is no problem, okay? But as a user, you have created the process and you would like to access, execute a file that is actually created by somebody else. All right, so what should happen now? In which domain you should operate? In the somebody else's domain or in your domain, right? This is the question. So what should happen when a process tries to execute a file which is created by another user? As we know, a file has user ID as well, so that executable file also has a user ID. So which user ID should be used by the running process? In, which, in other words, in which domain that running process should operate? There are two alternatives, the, created, or the, the creator of the process in the domain of the creator of the process, you start up the process, okay? Or the owner of the file executed by the process, okay? Remember when a process started, it can call the exact system call to execute a different file, right? So now, after that point, what should be the user ID associated with the process? The user ID that at the time that it's created or the user ID that it is now executing, right? For example, the file, the executable file is created by Ali, but the process is created by, for example, Veli, okay? So which user ID should we use? This is the question. So domain switch can happen. Domain switch can be established, uh, can, can happen. Each file has associated with it a domain bit, okay? Set user ID bit. When file is executed and set user ID associated with the file is on, okay, then the user ID, the domain of the process is set to owner of the file being executed, okay? Assume now, okay, assume now, this executable file is created by somebody else, all right? And I am a user that created a process, okay, that would like to execute that file, okay? So if the set user ID bit of that file is on, meaning one, okay, then this means that whenever I try to execute that file, my 
domain is switched to the domain of the file, basically to the user ID of the file, okay? If this bit is set, if this bit is not set, this switch is not happening. The process, even though it's executing that file, continues in the domain that it is started up, okay? So I am not switching. So this, for example, in this way, the Unix allows domain switching from the domain, from one domain to another, okay? From the domain that the process created to the, to the domain that the file, the executable file is now executing and the owner of that file is now the domain to be switched into, all right? So here we see an example, assume we have an executable that's created by process A, okay? The process A the, uh, is created, for example, by a user and that process A has created an executable file X, okay? So the owner of that file X is A and assume we set the set user ID bit for that file to one, on, okay? So when a process, for example, is started, initially that process Assume user B logs in and it creates a process B, all right? So that process initially has a user ID, which is B, okay? Then when that process tries to execute that file, depending on whether this bit is one or zero, if that bit is one, then after we start executing that file, the user ID of process B becomes A, okay? If that bit was zero, then the user ID of process B is not changed. It continues executing in domain B, even though it is executing a file from domain A, all right? So this is an example of domain implementation in Linux, okay? So you can, you define domains with user IDs and so on, and we have also objects associated with user IDs, right, files. Each file has a user ID, group ID, and so on, and each process also has a user ID, and depending on what, use, what is the user ID for the process and what is the user ID for the file, we can say whether that file is accessible by the process or not, okay? If you have created a file, for example, which does not give any read, write, execute permissions to other people, then I cannot open that file, okay? Because I am not executing in your domain, I am operating in a different domain, as a different process created by a different user, I cannot access your files, okay? In this way, protection is achieved in Unix. So this is not the only way to define the domains. In a different operating system, for example, Multics, the domains are actually defined hierarchically as rings, all right? One inside another. So we have several domains, one innermost domain, another domain, another domain. Each domain is considered as a ring, all right? An outer domain can actually uh, encapsulate the inner domain. So the innermost domain has the most privileges, all right? So now we have assigned, we have privileges associated with domains. So if, for example, DI and DJ, two domain rings, okay, one domain ring and another ring, so if J is less than I, for example, this can be J and this can be I, then domain J, domain I is a subset of domain J. So domain I will be a subset of domain J, okay? That means a process executing in that domain all right, we'll have more privileges than a process executing in this domain. Or it will have all the privileges that, a, that this domain has, okay? So this domain, inner ring, has all the privileges that the outer ring has, all right? So we have a hierarchy, hierarchy among the domains here. So DJ will have more privileges than DI, and in, it will actually encapsulate all the privileges of DI. So that means the, for example, consider this ring and that ring, okay? The privileges of that ring will be a subset of the privileges of that ring, okay? It's clear. So, for example, a kernel process or thread will be operating in ring zero with all the privileges possible, right? But a user process may be operating here, for example, with least amount of privileges, all right? So this is another way of defining domains and so on. So, in general, the question is, how can we model the protection? Basically, how can we specify, how can we specify which objects are there in the system, which processes are there, which domains are there, and what are the access rights? So for that, we can use a general scheme called access matrix, okay? So access matrix is a tool for modeling protection. So then what we do, we view the protection as a matrix, which is called access matrix, so that matrix now contains the access rights. So all the protection rules saying which object 
can be accessed by whom and in which way, they are expressed as entries in a matrix. So in this matrix, rows represent the domains and the columns represent the objects, okay? So if we have such an entry in the matrix, that means the access matrix IJ entry, okay? That means the row I column J, okay? That entry in the matrix will now contain a set of operations that a process executing in this domain I, all right, can do, can invoke on object J, okay? So in that entry, we specify the operations that can be performed on object J by the processes operating in domain I. So for each domain, we specify what can be done on the objects. So this is a general method and mechanism and can be implemented in various ways. So let's look to an example of an access matrix, okay? That can be used to specify the access rights, all right? that the domains can have on the objects. So assume we have th these ob the domains defined in the system, all right? So in a specific implementation, those domains may correspond, for example, to the users, different users, all right? But it doesn't have to be always like that. You can define the domains independent of the users as well, right? So it's a general scheme. So we have four domains created and defined, let's say, and we have, let's say, these resources to be protected in the system. We have three files, F1, F2, F3, and we have a printer, right? So now, each entry here specifies what can be done by that domain on that object. So for example, consider this, this entry here that is on row D4 and column F1. So it specifies that the domain D4 can read and write object F1. Okay? So this is the column that specifies the operations that can be performed on object by various domains. Okay? And this is a row, for example, that specifies what that domain can do, okay, over various objects, okay? So, for example, D2 can do what? What is the capability of D2? It can just print into the printer and do nothing else. It cannot access any files, right? So, for example, D3 can do what? It can read F2, it can execute F3, and so on, right? So, let's consider now from the perspective of objects. What can be done on F3 and by whom? All right, who can access F3 and how? F3 can be accessed by which domains? D1, D3, and D4, and what kind of operations can be performed by each domain? D1 can read it, D2, D3 can execute it, that, and D4 can read and write F3, okay? In this way, this is a general way of representing the access rights in the system. They represent domains and objects and what can be done by each domain over each object, okay? So now, this access matrix can be defined and can be stored somewhere and controlled by the kernel operating system. So when now the processes try to access those objects, the operating system should ensure that those rules are enforced. Those rules are enforced. So if a process in domain DI now tries to do an operation on object J, then the access matrix is consulted. So the operation that is to be performed on J is searched in the access matrix, all right, in the row of domain DI. If it exists, then we can perform that operation on object Y. Basically, we go to that entry of that, of the access matrix, the entry DIJ, comma, OJ, we go to that entry of the access matrix and search the operation there. If it is there, that means we can perform that operation. Or the domain DI can perform that operation on object OJ and operating system allows that operation to be executed. Otherwise, if operation is not in the access matrix, the operation is not permitted, all right? So the domain is denied the access to object OJ, all right? So what is possible is to we can define this access matrix statically. Of course, it is not very flexible then. So having a dynamic access matrix is more flexible. That means we should be able to modify the entries here. Sometime later, we should give some more rights, for example, to some other domains to do something on an object, okay? So, or we should be able to increase the capabilities of a domain and so on, right? So how can we do that? Then we should have some additional operations that we can perform now on the access matrix itself. So we need operations to add, delete, access rights to or from the matrix. So that can be done by special access rights for a domain. So we will see some special exercise that can be actually exercised over a matrix 
owner of object, copy of operation, control, transfer, and so on, we will see them. So with them, we can have, we can modify now the access matrix and we can have a dynamic access matrix. So over the time, the access matrix content can be changed, okay? Giving some more privileges or revoking some privileges and so on. So the access matrix concept design separates the mechanism from policy. So the access matrix is controlled by the operating system and stored by the operating system in the hard disk, all right, for example. And so operating system provides the access matrix plus the rules. It ensures that the matrix is observed and matrix is only manipulated, manipulated by the allowed agents and the rules in the matrix are strictly enforced. Okay, the operating system implements such a mechanism. It ensures that the access matrix rules are strictly enforced. All right, so this is the mechanism. Then who is actually specifying the policy? What, what access rights should be there? If you create an object, okay, a file, then you can specify who should be able to access that files. For each domain, you can, for example, specify what that domain can do and so on, right? So the policy specification is left to the user. So user dictates and specifies the policy. Who can access what object and in what mode can be defined by the users, all right? So we are specifying the mechanism that's implemented by the kernel from the policy that can be specified by the users, all right? In this way, we have a flexible system. Without changing the mechanism, then you can specify, you can change the policies easily, right? If you separate the mechanism from the policy. But if they are, if they are intermixed together, that means changing the policy requires changing the mechanism, which is not a flexible design, okay? So now let's see how we can actually uh, obtain more flexibility, for example, being able to switch from domains, all right? So a process may be started in one domain, okay? in this case, for example, in domain D3, then during its lifetime, it can stay in that domain, right? That means it will be only to read F2 and execute F3 during its lifetime, okay? So this may not be very flexible. You may want to change the domain of a process. Then what you need to do is you have to specify from which domain you can change to which domain. So how can we do that? In the access matrix, we can also specify that which domain can be changed into which domain. A process started in one domain can be changed to another domain. So to which domain we can change. So now we can specify those privileges also in the access matrix. To do that, we add new columns. So four new columns are added for four domains, okay? So for each domain, we add a new column. So that means we are treating also domains as objects, right? For them, we also specify some rules. So here, for example, we have domains and objects. And here we have a new capability or privilege switch, or right switch. That means, for example, D1 switch D2, okay? So what does it mean? It means that when a process starts in D1, it can change or switch into D2, right? So while it is in D2, do you think it can change to D1 back? We should look to here. So if it is operating in D2, it would like to change to D1. Is it enabled? No, it cannot switch. So, so we can specify now with such a matrix also from which domain we can change into which domain, all right? So with the switch right, we can specify those rules as well. So we have enhanced or access matrix a little bit more. So we would like to enhance it more so that we would like to actually be able to add more entries here, right? So here, for example, the access rights on the normal objects are fixed, okay? But let's say we would like to also give a read permission, reading F3 to domain D2. How can we do that? So we have to now add some new rights to do that. So we can add some new rights like a copyright, which can be indicated by an asterisk or star, okay, next to the right. So copyright means that the right can be copied. So assume we have such a matrix, okay? So we have a star next to domain, ne next to that right in domain D2 and for object F2, okay? So that says that domain D2 can read object F2, right? But we have also a star. So what does it say? If domain D2 wishes, okay? If it wishes, it can copy that permission to some other domain. That means it can give a read permission to D3 as well for the same file, okay? So as a result, the access matrix can be modified to such a matrix. So initially we had read permission only here, 
but now domain D2 can copy that read permission. It has the copyright, okay? It has the right to copy the permission. So that now it is giving the read permission, the, the same permission to somebody else, to some other domain, for example, to D3. As a result, we have modified the access matrix here into this access matrix, okay? By copying this privilege or right to here, okay? This is possible. So, for example, this star can indicate the copyright. So, we have now a more flexible access matrix, okay? In which rights can be copied from one row to another so that a domain can give the same right to somebody else, okay? So, we are talking about copying, for example, a right in the same column. All right, from one row to another. That means, for example, you are a process operating in some domain and you have a privilege on some object. You can give the same privilege to somebody else to operate on the same object, okay? So this can be enabled with the copy right. So let's look to the owner concept now. We can also specify the owner for an object. So, for example, we have an object F2, right? So here in one of the entries we specify the owner. That means D2 is now the owner okay, of F2. So you are a process and you are owner of an object. Then you should be able to do something, right? You should give some more rights. You should be able to give some more rights to somebody else. So the owner, for example, can now give any right to some other domains. As an owner of the file, for example, you can give read, write, execute permission to other people, right? You can change the mode of a file. It's possible. So now, if this is, for example, the initial state of the matrix, then, for example, D2 can give some more rights to somebody else. So as a result, we can have this matrix. So what has been done in this matrix, for example, here, the owner of F2, D2, has given right permission to D3, right? And the owner of F3, who is the owner of F3? D1, D2, D3? D2, right? Again. So, do you think it has given some more rights to somebody else? Yes, right? It has given right permission to D3, right? As a result, we have now this access matrix. So, the owner of F2 and F3, which is D2, has given some more permissions, right? In this way, for example, some more rights are added to the access matrix, okay? In this way, we are modifying the access matrix. So, for example, the owner of F1 is what? D1, right? Do you think it has done something? Yes. What is that? Yes, it has revoked the execute privilege from D4, right? D4 can no longer execute, for example, D, sorry, D3. D3 can no longer execute the file F1, okay? Yes. Can, can the owner give uh, copyright to other domains? Can that's, that's a decision. Usually it is not, okay? When you just give the you can copy the right, but you don't give the copyright. It's possible. It's possible, but it's a design decision that you have to select, okay? In some systems, you can do that. In some other systems, you cannot do that, all right? Any other questions? All right, then we have another right that can be specified, which is the control. So control is applicable only to domain objects, so you can specify the control right under the domain columns, in the domain columns, okay, under the domain objects. So what does it mean? For example, D2, D4, entry here. So we have a switch right, and we have a control right here. So what can the control right mean? So it means this, D2 controls D4. That means it can add some more rights to D4, or it can revoke some rights from D4, okay? So D2 can control D4. So it can increase or decrease the capabilities of D4. What are the capabilities at the moment of D4? Can you, can you see that? By looking at the access matrix, what can D4 do? To which objects it can attach? F1 and F3, right? It can write F1 and write F3. And for D4, we can also have the switch capability. When a process is operating in D4, it can switch to D4, D1 and so on, right? So now, D2 actually can control D4. It can, for example, remove this right. Okay? It can add some more rights here, okay? This is possible. So control means that a domain can control some other domain. So if you specify a control in one of these entries here, that means now 
that domain can control the domain in the column, all right? So control is applicable to only domain objects. DI can control DJ. Any excess right can be removed, added from DJ by DI. It means that. So with these extra rights, control, switch, copy, and owner, and so on, now we have enough power to modify the excess matrix dynamically, right? So it doesn't have to be always static. It can be modified by the domains, all right, in this, uh, with, uh, as with the examples that we have seen. So now the question is this. How can we implement the excess matrix? So this uh, idea, right, to define the domains, to define the objects to be products, and to define the excess rights, right? So how can you implement that if you are the operating system designer? Where do you store the excess matrix? It has to be stored permanently, right? Maybe in the hard disk, right? So what is the property of the excess matrix? It can be quite huge, right? We can have lots of files, not three files, but 10,000 files in the system, and we can have lots of domains, right? So do you think that, so we have a large matrix here. Do you think that it will be a very dense matrix or very sparse matrix? Sparse, right? So that means if you are just storing the matrix, access matrix, as it is like that, then it will occupy a huge space in the hard disk. So it, it will not be efficient, all right? So there are different ways of implementing that access matrix. We will see two ways of doing that. One is the access control list implementation. The other is the capability list implementation. Now, in the access control list implementation, we are actually looking to the matrix from the object's point of view. So consider the objects now, the normal objects, and what kind of operations we can perform on them and by which domains, right? So this fact for each these facts for each object can be stored associated with the object, okay? So in this way and in a compact form. You can specify, for example, associated with obje uh, object F1, the fact that it can be read by D1 and it can be written by D4. These facts can be stored as part of the object F2. For example, in Unix, you can specify them as the attributes of the file, okay? In the inode or in some other block that is pointed by the inode and so on. So this is the access control list implementation. For each object, we specify an access control list. For example, for an object, an arbitrary object, we can specify such a access control list. It says that domain one can read and write the object, domain two can read, domain three can read, okay? So we specify, we just store such an information for every object, okay? So that means we are just taking the columns here, condensing them and storing them with associated objects, all right? This is how we implement the access matrix, all right? This is one way of doing that. The other way of doing that is capability list implementation. In this case, we are just taking the rows and storing them. So each row here is actually indicating what? It's indicating the capability of the corresponding domain. So it says that, for this row, says that, for example, what domain D1 can do, all right? It says that domain D1 can read F1, can read F3, and so on, right? So this information can be stored now, okay? So you can, in a condensed form, you don't have to say anything here. You can specify or store this fact, that fact associated with the domain D1. So you have now a capability list. A capability, and another capability, another capability, another capability, right? So we can now use a capability list. For each domain, what operations are allowed? What operations are allowed and on what objects this information can be stored for each domain? For example, this is the information that has to be stored for one domain. So access rights of that domain or the capabilities of that domain, what the domain can do is stored. So let's look to this example, what's stored there. This stored information says that, the capability list for the domain says that, object one can be read by that domain, right? Object four can be read, written, and executed by that domain, and object five can be read, written, deleted, and copied by that domain, okay? For each domain, we specify now such access rights. Of course, this is a condensed list, so we are not including here the empty entries, right? So therefore, less space will be used, okay? Any, any questions? <laughs>
So now a process, all right, operating in one domain, right? So the operating system will know in which domain it is operating, right? Then the operating system will access the capability list associated with that domain. So the capability list will tell us what can be done by that process, which objects can be accessed, and in which way, okay? Basically, what the process is capable of doing. So it is specified here. It is capable of reading object one, reading, writing, executing object four, and so on, all right? So this is another way of implementing the access matrix. Any questions? So a little bit different issue or mechanism is the role-based access control, all right? So in this case, what we are doing is we are now creating roles that can be taken by processes. And each role has associated with it a set of privileges, okay? So initially, a process may be assigned a role, okay? So it has some certain privileges, so, right? So when you logged in as a user, you are associated with a role, for example, a system administrator or a normal user and so on, a role, okay? So now with that role, we have certain set of privileges. So that means a process created by that user will have those privileges, okay? So later on, you can try to change the role, all right? So there may be another role, okay? And you may want to change to that role, all right? Of course, that changing mechanism may require you to enter a password. If you know the password, for example, you can change your role to the new role, okay? So that role, for example, may have some more privileges and so on. So then your process will be having some more privileges, okay? So this is called role-based access control. In this case, you are defining roles and so on, and process are assigned roles, and you can switch between roles. So another issue while designing a protection scheme is, how can we revoke the access rights? Right, so with the access matrix, with the capability list, and with the access control list and so on, we define the access rights. So later on, we may want to revoke or remove some access rights from some objects. How can we do that? We will discuss this after the break, okay? Okay, so as a result, we have basically two ways of implementing the access matrix. One was the access control list. For each object, we associate an access control list. And in that list, we specify what can be done on that object by each domain, all right? Or we can implement the access control matrix as capability list. So each row is considered as a capability list. So we specify, in this case, the domains. So this is not object-oriented approach, right? It's a domain-oriented approach. We specify, in this case, the domains and what can be done by that domain. So basically, we are specifying the capabilities of a domain. So here we see, for example, the capabilities of one domain. For each domain, we have such a list. For each domain, we have a capability list. So a process, when it is started up, it has associated domain. So that domain, the capability list regarding that domain, associated with that domain, specifies what the processes can, process can do, okay? So whenever a process tries to execute an operation on some object, then the capability list is searched whether that operation is permitted or not for that process operating in that domain, all right? So now let's look, for example, assume later on we would like to remove a, a write, a write from an object. So you have a file, for example, and you would like to remove a write from the file, okay? You would like, for example, disable the write permission to the file, all right? Initially, the processes could write to the file, but now you would like to remove the write permission. You want to revoke the write permission from that object. So how can we do that? So we may want to revoke some rights from an object. So how can we do that? How we will revoke the rights and whether it is easy or difficult to remove the rights depends how the access matrix is implemented. So let's consider these two implementations and compare them whether they are easy to remove the right or not. So in access list implementation, what we have? We have access list associated with each object. So you want to remove a right from the object, then what do you have to do? You have to go to the associated access list and remove the right from there, okay? So you can remove the right from one domain or from all the domains. You can specify, for example, you can find out all domains that have the right permission and you can remove all these permissions or access rights from that access list of that object. In this way, you have revoked 
the right from that object, okay? So it is very easy. You just go to the access list of the object and you revoke the rights. It is simple and immediate. But if you have implemented your access matrix as capability list, then what we have to do? You want to remove a right from an object, all right? But you don't have an access list associated with the object. So the rights associated with the object are actually scattered around in the capabilities. So you have to search all the capability lists to find out the access rights regarding that object and inspect them whether they are right operational or not and then remove those rights, okay? So of course this is more, this, this makes more time, okay? So it is not very efficient to remove, revoke a right if you have implemented your capability list, your access matrix using capability list, all right? So this can require to locate capability in the system before capability can be revoked, okay? So you have to first find out the capability associated with the object and then you have to revoke the right from that object and so on, okay? So of course you can speed up this process by using back pointers, indirections, keys, reacquisition and so on. Back pointers approach means that each object has back pointers to the capabilities so that when you want to revoke something from that object you can use those back pointers to find out the capabilities and you can revoke the you can remove the rights regarding that object from those capabilities okay so you can use back pointers to easily locate to easily locate the capabilities associated with that object when you want to revoke a right from an object okay so there are systems actually that are using the capability lists or the access lists and so on. In Unix, for example, we use the access lists. And in Hydra, for example, the capability-based approach is used. In Cambridge Cap system, it's also a capability-based approach is used. So you can read from the book how these systems are designed and the capability-based uh, systems are designed. So, so far we have talked about the protection schemes that are provided by the kernel, okay? so. These protection schemes, whether they are access list based or whether they are capability based and so on, they try to protect the objects that are controlled by the kernel. For example, file object, devices, they are all controlled by the kernel, okay? So, what you can do is that you can also, you may want to protect your application level objects and so on, all right? Then it may be good to have langu language support for protection. So we have also language-based protection. For example, Java can do that. The protection is handled by the Java Virtual Machine, a class that is loaded, all right, whenever you create an object, for example, and would like to operate on that object, the associated class has to be loaded so that the methods can be called, of the class can be called, and so on, right? A class is assigned a protection domain when it is loaded by the JVM, Java Virtual Machine. The protection domain indicates what operations the class can perform and cannot perform. All right? So in Java, we have these things. For example, in a class definition, you can hide the members so that those members of the class are not accessed by other class and so on. So we have some protection uh, between the classes in Java. So we can have language support for protection as well. Of course, this depends on the language, but the current trend is this. You have also language support uh, for protection. So this is all we want to talk about the protection, chapter 14, and this is the end of the lecture. Do you have any questions regarding the protection? Okay, thank you.